Hi, I'm Meryn Somerset Webb, Editor-in-Chief of Money Week, and welcome to another one of our video interviews. With me today is Edward Chancellor, who's a very experienced and well-known uh, financial strategist and investment expert, also the author of this week's cover story, or last week's cover story by the time you see this, uh, which is very interesting about gold miners and the editor, editor really, of this most recent book, Capital Returns. It's a series of essays written by very successful money managers at Marathon, and Edward has uh, introduced them beautifully and then edited them into a great collection, well worth reading, and it'll be on our Christmas book list when we get to that. Now, let's talk briefly about the premise of the book, or the way Marathon invests, should I say. They invest uh, on a sort of capital cycle basis. Yes. Um, so the capital cycle, or what Marathon Asset Management is called the capital cycle, is really to look at companies not from the perspective of their valuation, whether they're cheap or expensive on a PE basis or a price to book basis, but really to look at whether capital is entering into or exiting an industry. And if you look at things that way, sometimes you find businesses that look expensive um, but are actually um, quite cheap because they can sustain returns for a long time. But more to the point, uh, investors often fail to pay attention to the amount of capital that is being spent uh, in an industry. Now take, for instance, the global mining industry or, or, or the energy uh, oil stocks recently. Over the last 10 years, there have been enormous surges in capital spending in both those sectors. And that surge in capital spending prefigured both the collapse in prices um, in commodity prices, but also the collapse in stocks. So if you look at things from a capital cycle perspective, in other words, capital flowing into or out of an industry, you're likely to be a better investor. So the, I the basic idea is that as capital flows into an industry, supply of whatever that industry produces is going to go up very fast, then the price of that thing is going to fall. Um, and you want to be <laughs> in when supply is low and out when supply is high. Yeah, I mean, the, the principle is very simple, as you expressed it. In fact, so simple, one shouldn't really need to write a book on this. No, I've definitely made it sound too simple in that no, case. No, I, I don't I think so. I mean, look, let, let's discuss a few of these instances over the last 20 years that, that your, your readers, viewers might uh, remember. We go back to the dot-com bubble in the 1990s. Uh, there was a surge of spending in technology, in particular laying out fiber optic cables um, both in Europe and in the States and, and actually crossing, <laughs> crossing continents too. Uh, that, in the UK there were a, a number of so-called alternative carriers or alternets listed and these are businesses with huge capital funding needs. Now at the same time we had the telecoms companies spending vast amounts of money on 3G uh, mobile networks and so forth. Um, now, that surge in spending anticipated the collapse, the dot com collapse. In fact, it, it determined the dot com collapse um, in 2000, in, in 2000 to 2002. So you, res th so you got to a situation then that of all the fiber optic cable that had been laid, something like 95% of it was excess capacity. Now move into you know, the next decade, and you saw a surge of, of you saw a, a housing boom, and you saw a surge of spending on, uh, on, on construction spending, re residential real estate. Not so much in the UK, but certainly in, in Spain and Ireland and in, um, and in the US. And what's quite interesting about the US example is that some very well-known investors in 2005, 2006 started saying, hey, housing stocks, US housing stocks are cheap. They're trading roughly at book value. Um, this is the low range at which they've ever traded, and you want to you know, you want to hold your nose and, you know, there may be problems in the housing market, but you want to buy these stocks. Now, those stocks, on average, fell roughly 75% from that point to their trough, say, four or five years later. Mm. So you could have bought a housing stock of a perfectly respectable company that actually survived the real estate bust. You could have bought it at a very cheap value and still lost 75% of your money. And the capital cycle argument is that what you should have been looking for is not the valuation per se, but how much money had been sucked into these businesses 
in the run-up. And the, tr the truth is that those businesses have been expanding their capital base by about 25% per year for the previous five years. So they were riding for a fall. Mm -hmm. And we see this time and time again. Uh, the markets encourage and fund capital sp spending. Investors cheer it on. Then things start um, turning, you know, turning down a bit, and the value investors come in and say these stocks are cheap, and then the value investors get completely wiped out. Mm -hmm. So if you understand the capital cycle, you you stand back from the, the from the sort of the madness of the crowds as things are being bid up, but you also avoid the, the great value traps which are which which um, constantly hitting so-called contrarian or value investors. Mm. And you also stand back from the demand story on the way up, uh, because this is the way that these these events are sold to investors, that the supply side is rarely mentioned. What is mentioned is the ongoing demand. Yes, now, I mean, you're the quite demand right. for houses now, you're is, quite is right. unending, and we extrapolate and extrapolate and extrapolate the demand and never add up how much supply is coming on at the same time. Yeah, so, and this, uh, this interesting point is that people I don't quite know why, but they love to think about project demand into the future. They loved, I suppose, because, well, they like projecting demand because demand is unknowable. Mm. And because it's unknowable, then you can have any sort of fantasy you want about it at all, you know, optimistic or pessimistic. But, you know, given the nature of mankind, those would tend to be pe optimistic. Now, people, so th a huge amount of work um, goes into forecasting um, demand. As, as our mutual friend Russell Napier says, uh, analysts spend 90% uh, of their time thinking about and forecasting demand and 10% of their time thinking about supply. Now the interesting thing about supply is that supply actually can be forecast. It's yes. the, because it takes, a, in most industries, it takes quite a while for the supply to come on stream. You can see how much assets have grown inside an industry or, or in, inside any particular business. Uh, you can see it through um, any number of measures, through IPO issuance, through secondary share issuance, through companies taking on more debt, through companies going through uh, a boom such as the mining companies or the ho US home builders that are, who've had a sort of surge in profitability and have reinvested those profits. You can measure it technically through things like looking at uh, current capital spending to uh, depreciation ratios. Or, or, or you can look at it, for instance, again, technically, you can look at the rate of profitability, reported profitability of a company to its, uh, to its uh, cash flow, the so-called cash, conver cash conversion rate. And if a company is generating large profits but not generating any cash flow, uh, it's probably in a negative phase of the capital cycle. So the point, to go back to what you were saying, is that investors, if they knew the right way to approach, would be thinking 90% about supply and then fantasizing 10% about the completely, or not quite completely, but more or less completely unknowable demand side. Yeah. So they'd focus for once on something they can actually measure. But well, that would make life <laughs> boring and simple. So It will also uh, put an <laughs> awful lot of analysts out of work, particularly this time of year. Yeah, but the, uh, actually, it's not the question just of analysts. It's the investment bankers. Mm. As ever, the investment bankers are up to mischief. The I mean, I'm sure your readers, viewers know that their worst enemy is the investment banker, not because I the investment banker do. is a greedy bastard, because we know he's a greedy bastard, but what he really wants to do is to uh, is to generate fees by raising capital, and if you raise capital uh, and you throw it at any industry, you do returns will not decline. And so the investment banker, and with the broker incorporated into the investment banking operations, will serve as cheerleader le leaders always to the into the capital raising process and will tend to be blind until after the fact mm. <laughs> that, that, that too much capital has been mi misallocated. Okay. So what does, this, what does this mean for the value investor? The ordinary value investor is usually wrong because they pick the wrong point in the cycle to invest. Yes, and uh, I think this is, this is where the value investor has to, um, has to show a tiny bit more um, intelligence uh, than, sh than a pure sort of 
contrarian instinct. Now, the contrarian instinct, as you know, is... is we all have that. No, 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 no <laughs> not you. You and I have it. But the point is that it's a perfectly fine and admirable trait. And we admire it We admire deeply, it. And we don't like people who run with the herd. No. But th that alone is not enough to uh, deliver, uh, you know, to protect your money. What you have to do is be an intelligent contrarian. And the intelligent contrarian, among other things, will be looking to see how long the capital cycle takes to play out. Now, say, t go back to, um, you know, to go back to what we were talking about, the U.S. home builders. Now, the U.S. Ho home building cycle ran uh, for about five years on the upside. I mentioned to you that the stocks were putatively cheap in 2005 um, when they were trading at book. Um, and then the book <laughs> disappeared <laughs> in a great, great big hole. Now, if you, so it was obviously a bad time to buy the stocks uh, in, in, in that U.S. home builders in 2005. How did you know it was a bad time then? You can see, you can see the cheap price, um, but you're an intelligent contrarian. What else do you see that says to you, I know how cheap that is, I'll but I'm not buying it now? So I'll tell you, so look, this is, another, this is another area where, uh, if you remember, the value investors uh, got it wrong in two th around the time of the global financial crisis. It's the typical value investor says, uh, he has f he's full of false modesty. He goes, I don't know nothing about macroeconomics. It doesn't interest me. I just know about stocks and so on. And I just know about companies and blah, blah, blah. I just analyze, you know, you know, profit and loss accounts and balance sheets and so on and so forth. Well, actually, around the time of, of the financial crisis, in case you hadn't noticed, there was a great housing bubble. Now, it, I mean, everyone knew there was a housing bubble. There was, I remember, you know, one of the, one of the analysts at the time uh, or, or providers of information used to just provide a, a, you know, a chart of the number of mentions of housing bubble. The housing bubble was the best known fact. It was everywhere. In, mm -hmm. in the world, really, uh, apart from uh, Ben Bernanke, who didn't seem to know about it. Um, the, but it was a very well-known fact. Now, that housing bubble had led to, if you will, a, what I call a fundamental bubble in the balance sheets of the of the home builders, so they yes they'd reported huge amounts of profitability, but they were illusory profits. And but you didn't even really need to know that. The the, the nice thing about the capital cycle approach is just say, okay, you can be as dumb as a value investor or as blinkered if you will, but just say I'm going to look at companies and see have how much they've been expanding their their their, their assets. Um, and I'm going to look at them not just on an individual basis, but I'm also going to look at their competitors too. And if there has been massive expansion of assets, never mind how good the story is, you know, China or you know running out of oil or you know, energy super cycle or God, you know, the dot com future. It doesn't matter how good the story. It doesn't even matter whether the story pans out exactly as predicted as was the case with the dot-com stuff, um, yeah. but, but and not with, let's say, you know, the commodity or the energy, you know, the energy, uh, the peak oil thesis. So don't try, try not to pay attention to that. Just look only at the expansion of assets. Now, I'll tell you, I mean, this is not just my argument. Um, there's, when I, I, I edited another book on the capital cycle for the same people, Marathon, about um, 10, 11 years ago. And at the time, when I was writing the introduction to that book, I, I looked around to see if there was any academic research on this subject of, of the relationship between investment and returns. And the truth was, there was hardly anything out there at the time. Mm. But when I came to um, edit the new book and write a new introduction, I actually found quite a lot of new research from uh, finance academics in the States. And the gist of those findings are that there is an inverse relationship between investment or asset growth and future returns. So we, we all know, or at least you should all know, that everything else being equal, growth stocks, you know, companies that sell on high uh, 
price earnings ratios and companies that 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 sell uh, high price to book deliver uh, returns below the market average and the converse is that so-called value stocks cheap stocks uh, deliver um, above average returns now you have to qualify that finding in the light of the new research uh, which I touch upon in this book which is to say how how much investment has been going on because what we now find is that most of the value growth effect mm -hmm. belongs to differentials in investment so it's not really to do with cheapness um, you know investors expectations of growth and investors um, pessimism they used if you will the the historic explanation uh, of value growth anomaly as they call it is just you know aren't investors don't investors get carried away mm. yes they do get carried away but like most findings of behavioral finance this is a rather facile observation <laughs> and you need to go a tiny bit deeper and I think if you go deeper you start thinking about differentials in capital in capital spending it's sort of the same thing though isn't it in that uh, investors get carried away at times when they've heard the story about the demand and when they're hearing the story about the demand that's when the assets are growing and when the capital spending is happening so it's a I mean, it's facile, it's not that facile. I mean, it is really what's happening. Um, you can put it like that if you want, but I like... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like to miss an opportunity to knock behavioural finance people, because, partly because they, they're just, to my mind, they're telling just so stories. Mm. It's, it's, um, it's sort of investment for dummies, so to speak. And it's amusing. You can give a, you know, an amusing talk about how in, you know, investors' expectations and delve into... Um, you know, s psychological frailties and so on, but actually it's not really to do <laughs> with the business investment. The business yes. of investment, yes, it's obviously driven by human beings and human beings are frail and full of folly. We all know that. I mean, I, as you know, I wrote a book, on History of all Financial it, Speculation, yeah. which, 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 you know, was, um, you know, very much on that theme. But the more I think about it, the more I think that what's important is not investors' expertise, you know, expectations. Yes, they are there, but they're really the the epiphenomenon, the icing on the cake. The, what you really need to do is to sort of break through that icing and look at again to go back to what I was saying is look in the instance of uh, of the capital cycle and looking to look at the investment cycles. You know, because you know investors may have very high expectations. They may be very ebullient, very bullish about a particular sector, but if that sector has not um, attracted a huge amount of capital investing, the chances are that those expectations, those ebullient expectations will be met. Now go back, for instance, to the, well, I can give you any number of examples, but I'll get back to the home building mm -hmm. example. It's in the, in the States, in Ireland, in, sp in Spain, there was you know, obviously a lot of um, excited expectation about how house house prices and inflated house prices, and you could you could describe that in in your way as a sort of investor rationality. But there was a huge investment response. Now, yeah. when we looked at Ireland and Spain, we found that that I think Irish and, and Spanish excess home building was roughly fifteen times annual demand. So you can see the huge. Yeah, I mean the huge um, glut of oversupply that had built up. Now, American um, overbuilding had been roughly five years, we calculated. I mean, it's just rule of thumb. And it took roughly five years to burn off. OK, that's fair. Now, look at the UK. UK had, and, and Australia for that matter, they both had very similar um, bubbles in terms of house prices. So you, both you. British house prices and Australian house prices, they followed, well, they, as far as I remember, they went up higher mm. than US national prices. But in neither country was there a demand, uh, was there a supply response. So take, for instance, the, and I, I know, but I, this is the field where I, you know, when I first got into this, um, in, into the investment, you know, an analyst business, I was working for an investment bank um, 
in the city in the early 1990s where, and this was in the aftermath of the great, uh, of a very serious housing bust in the early 1990s. And one of our clients, Tarmac, had lost a great deal of money. We were raising money for Tarmac. Now what I, and I studied the, the UK housing market at the time, and what you could see was a huge supply response in the 1990s to the rising house prices and then the subsequent bust. Now, now fast forward 15 years, what happened? The UK ha ha home construction business, or well, the home builders, were immensely consolidated, if mm -hmm. you remember. Just a handful of companies where there'd been, I don't know, let's say 15 or 20 builders, uh, large builders, but there were probably only about four or five of note. Uh, the for any number of reasons, uh, it was very difficult to build um, to build new houses in the country. Now, and this here points to an interesting uh, opportunity that was created, and it, uh, I can identify it in retrospect, is that the <laughs> whereas the Good U.S. <laughs> is better than not at all. <laughs> exactly. where, whereas, whereas the U.S. home builders were value traps uh, into even in 2008, going into the crisis, and, and in 2009 too, the, U, the UK home builders, which had also collapsed in price, I mean, say take Persimmon, I remember looking at its stock, and its stock, I think it went, I mean, you perhaps you know better than I, I think it went from about 15 pounds to three pounds, or something yeah, like no, that. Yeah, these were phenomenal collapses yeah, yeah, so in it, these stocks. Yeah, yeah, and it collapsed. But actually, <laughs> if you looked at Persimmon, and the, and the UK home building industry, you'd see that there actually hadn't been any you know, overdone capital cycle. So these stocks recovered much better. So if you, if you knew nothing about either uh, you know, the, the particularities of the US home builders or the, or the UK home builders, but you just looked at their asset growth, you'd have said the, from a capital cycle perspective that the UK Built home builders were, were an outstandingly attractive. And of course, that turned out to be the case. They were. Yes, <laughs> no, 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 no,